Good morning again to you, church family. Are you listening to the words that we're singing? Are they not explosive when you consider the truths? Uh, the Lamb will come back and He will He will take care of business, won't He? That's what we're singing. I want to publicly appreciate uh, you, Matt, and our ladies, Bethany, Alita, Caitlin is away. Uh, every single week leading us, it has been a monumental effort to begin to incorporate instruments. And uh, boy, the Lord has really blessed that. Um, there are so many people who serve in so many different ways. Uh, thankful for Joel reading the scripture. Brian is away and normally does that. And my dad in the beginning. There are really so many ways I'm overwhelmed. It's a, it's a monumental effort to come together every week and to watch this church family and all who are associated with it serve and prepare, loving one another, preparing worship guides, cutting the grass, cleaning the, the building, reaching out and investing to hurting hearts. We could be here all day reviewing the ways that God's people serve. And I am the only one on the paid staff. We have never paid anyone to do anything else other than minister the word. And so it's really remarkable if you think about it the way that God is really stirring and moving and people are just uh, joyful and desiring to use their life for the kingdom. I had planned my preaching schedule for at least the next several months and really begin beyond. But the key word there is had, because now as a result of this morning, that has changed. And the reason why that's changed is because I open up the study Psalm 132 having already mapped out the, the next several months and beyond ahead. But when you open God's word, it's like opening a treasure chest. Sometimes, many times, you have a decent idea based on the size of the chest about the contents within it. But you really don't know until you open it and you begin to dig through it. And as I began to dig through this psalm, which for a long time I planned to preach in one message, I realized I just don't think that that is possible for me to do uh, because there is so much here that we need to enjoy. And so we plan, Lord willing, to work through half of it through verse 10, and then we'll plan to come back next week. So as you have your Bibles open to Psalm 132, I want to begin to introduce us to the terrain before us. We consider words like power and rule and authority and thrones and dominion and kingship. And these words in our modern society are hair raising. They're defense raising. They're skepticism raising. Because typically we only like to think about these words like thrones and authority when we are the one on it and we are the one using it. <laughs> and if that not the case, then let's not think about that in a positive way. Authority, however, is not a bad thing, but a good and godly stewardship that God has given in proper ways to be used justly. Proverbs 29 verse 2 says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule which is where we are today, by and large, the people groan. Proverbs 28 ends by stating that when the wicked rise to power, people hide. But when they perish, the righteous then come out of hiding and they flourish and they increase. So when the wicked have the levers of power, the people are trampled on and they hide and they groan. I want to encourage you to hold your place in Psalm 132. And before we get there, I would like for you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Go ahead and find your place, if you would, in 2 Samuel, because that will be the complimentary text to home base this morning, which is Psalm 132. 2 Samuel 23, there's so much here that bolsters our passage in Psalm 132. Ruling authority in the hands of God and kingship and rule and power and authority in the hands of God's people used in a godly manner is a very sweet blessing for all who are under and submit to that authority. Look with me in 2 Samuel 23 at some of the last words of King David 
who is oftentimes referred in the passage before us this morning. Now, these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the man who with one hand slung swords and cut the heads off of giants and then held it in front of him to taunt the enemies of God. On the other hand is the sweet psalmist of Israel. How's that for biblical manhood for you? The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, I want you to see what the exercise of that true and genuine real authority causes those who are under it ordinarily to do. He dawns on them like the morning light. Like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For he will not cause to prosper, for will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But worthless men are all like thorns that are thrown away. David's last words are about the extension of true and godly authority and the flourishing of those who are under it and the blessing that God intends for it to be through King David's life, through his heirs, and through the one and only heir that we will culminate with this morning And all who are under it rejoice in that rule of God. And all those who have authority, which is all of us in one way or another, are to extend and reflect the kingship of God in whatever manner that we have. You will never, even in eternity, escape authority. We are all under authority in multiple ways. And when the crown rights of Jesus Christ are taught and obeyed and enjoyed, when God is worshiped and revered, when God's covenant is remembered and honored, when God's house is attended to rightly, Psalm 132 says that the people shout for joy. They're satisfied in God's provisions. They shine like the noonday as God clothes them directs them and communes with them. Rejoicing in God's righteous rule is the title of my sermon this morning. As you look with me in Psalm 132, this is a royal psalm. This is a psalm that is only fit for a king. This psalm looks back to King David, and then it looks forward to David's royal heirs, and then even beyond to their sons. He looks back at David's desire to build God's house. And then the psalm continues in the present tense in, uh, in, in, with a charge to God's people. Together, they're being called to worship the Lord in his house. And then the psalm ends with the psalmist looking forward to God's covenant and his blessing on his people in his dwelling place. We look back to the Davidic covenant, which we read this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we realize ultimately that only Jesus Christ can fulfill the coronation and the marching orders that are being displayed in 2 Samuel 7, as well as in Psalm 132, to which it refers He is the anointed one. So as you'll scan with me, you'll notice in Psalm 132 verses 1 through 4 that the psalmist begins by calling on the Lord to remember David's desire to build this house. And then it moves in verses 6 through 10 to calling upon each other to go to God's house and worship him. And then the psalmist even calls on the Lord to dwell and inhabit his own house. 
And then he moves to the priests and he calls on them to be clothed in God's royal righteousness. And the result is that the saints are shouting for joy. If you'll look with me in verses 11 and 12, we'll see the psalmist, the psalmist move to the Lord saying to David that a throne would continue and a line would be extended and that they are to keep God's covenant. And then we'll end in verses 13 through 18 next week, Lord willing, with this buffet of blessings that are poured out on the people of God, unleashed. And then we'll see the wicked who are clothed as well, but with everlasting shame. I believe that the practical application of Psalm 132 is that it gives great comfort and it instills tremendous confidence in all who look to the power and promises of God in their life. Let's begin with the heading. Look with me. You'll see inscribed at the top that this is a song of ascents. Like all of the ones that come before, it's the 13th of 15, and it is the longest song of ascent. The Psalms in general, all of them, were the Hebrew hymnal. They were intended not so much to be read, although they were, but they were intended to be sung. This was their hymnal if you will, their Psalter. And many scholars believe, as I've mentioned before, that these songs were used probably after the exile and after Ezra and Nehemiah returned and later as the people of God would march back up the holy hill of Zion and they would return for the regular feasts and festivals to worship the Lord and they would sing these psalms all the way home, we certainly think. Scholars range in what they believe to be the background behind Psalm 132. Some believe that it unfolds during David's day and David himself being the author. Others believe that Solomon used it when his original temple was dedicated to the Lord. Others extend it out to Ezra's day, to the second temple. So we aren't really given any context. We don't know the background, but we can look within this psalm and notice that the occasion refers to the Ark of the Covenant, which we are going to look at this morning. The Ark of the Covenant was being returned to God's house. It had been behind enemy lines for a long time, and it was having a profound impact on those who held it, and it had a profound impact on the people of God who were without it. So what do the people of God do to get back the Ark of the Covenant? They call Indiana Jones. No, they don't call Indiana Jones. We are going to look to see what they do in 1 Samuel 6 and 7 during Samuel's day. And then we'll see what's promised in 2 Samuel 6 and 7 during David's day. They're longing for God's presence, which is signified through the Ark of the Covenant to return, to be in their midst, to to signify God's power and glory and communion, that they would meet with him in his favor and his king would rule. In Psalm 132, we see a resolve to build, to revere, to honor, and to enjoy. And all of these calls begin with remembering. I want to give you the four points before us that I see breaking down this psalm. Number one, We see the resolve to build God's house. The psalmist is saying of David to God. We see that in verses 1 through 5. Number 2, in verses 6 through 10, we see the resolve to revere God's presence. Believers are then speaking to each other as the camera angle shifts. Number three, we see the resolve to honor God's covenant in verses 11 and 12. The Lord then says directly to King David. And then finally, in verses 13 through 18, we see the resolve to enjoy God's blessing. The psalmist says of God, speaking to everyone that belongs to him. 
Look with me, number one, the resolve to build God's house. The psalmist is speaking of David and his prayers to the Lord. He says in verse 1, he opens with the word, remember, O Lord, O Yahweh, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, saying this, I will not enter my house or the tent of my house, it could read, or get into my bed or the couch of my bed, it could read. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids, which is a reference used often in the scripture of going without sleep. We see it in Proverbs 6, 4. He says in verse 5, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Remember, O Lord. When he calls on the Lord to remember, do you think that he is do you think that he is believing that God has a memory problem? Do you think that God possibly has slipped into a little bit of dementia, if not Alzheimer's? Well, certainly it would seem so. In your life, does it seem as if God has forgotten you or your circumstances? As if God doesn't see, he doesn't remember his promises? He's no longer active and involved? The psalmist often experiences that. But he knows that God has not truly forgotten in a cognitive sense. It's a way of saying, Lord, would you put it before your eyes? Would you give attention to once again? Would you call to the forefront of your mind a promise that you have made that has been central in the life of your people? And we do not see it unfolding. We don't see the ball getting down the field. If anything, we're losing ground and the other team is about to score a safety, except this isn't a game. This is life and death in the balance. And so he calls out to the sacred covenant keeping, the self-existent, the high and holy God of heaven, invoking his sacred name, Yahweh. And if you'll look with me in verses 2 and 5, twice he calls him the mighty one of Jacob. A title that's used elsewhere beginning in Genesis 49, 24 that refers to God as the one who has sovereign strength and who imparts that strength and uses it. It's first use of Jacob when he blessed his sons as the Lord would strengthen him in the day of battle. The background to this passage is 2 Samuel 7-2. You can also note 1 Chronicles 22 and Acts 7-46. It takes us back to David's life, and David sees all that God has done for him. And David sees that he's established his own house as the king. And all of the affairs of the kingdom are in order, except David realizes that the house of God is still not established. God has lived in a tent or a tabernacle, if you will, through all of the days of Moses and the wilderness wanderings. It was a sort of portable sanctuary where God was worshipped in a very particular way, according to the design that Moses gave to him. So God's people don't have a place to worship him in such a way that is fitting for a royal king. And you can only envision David thinking, as the king of all of the earth, this is my living quarters, and the king of heaven has not even half of what an earthly king enjoys. We want to signify his glory to the entire world. And so David says, I am going to build a house for God. To which God responds, even if you could, do you think that a house could house me? The heaven and the earth is my footstool. What are you going to build for me to live in, David? But it's a noble desire. But God says, David, the problem is that you are a man of war and a man of blood. 
And I have used you in a particular way to defend my people and extend my kingdom. However, it will be your son Solomon who will build this house, the original temple. And so David gets to work and he puts together the finest and the most expensive and the most luxurious of provisions and he stores them up so that so that God would use Solomon to build this house. Having subdued all of his enemies, now they were in a period of peace. And God had made this promise to David. And you think, wow, how wonderful it would be to be David. But then you remember, God is not making these promises to use David and his family because of any merit in David. We're talking about the man that committed adultery and then put that woman's wife, or rather husband, to death. We're talking about a double crime. We are not talking about any merit in and of David. We're talking about the covenant promises of God, even through a sinner such as David, to continue and establish his throne and promises, even that we enjoy today. So God's people through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai have returned to the land. They've rebuilt God's house. But here in Psalm 132, the psalmist is calling on God to put before himself David's enduring oath, looking back to the first temple to build it. So the problem is not that if they don't build God's house, that God's going to be on the streets homeless with nowhere to go. The temple was where God was worshipped and his presence was manifested. And David says, I cannot sleep. The only place in scripture where we specifically see an oath mentioned. I will not go to bed. I will not close my eyes until I see the dwelling place of God established among his people. Do you know what it is to deprive yourself of sleep? Do you know how significant it is to say, I won't take a nap and I won't go to bed until this is done? It's a very risky process or promise because I don't know about you, but if I start the smallest of projects in my house, a two-hour project means three-week Three weeks and 47 trips to Lowe's. I'm telling you, I am going to be very careful about making those kinds of promises to the Lord. Because if you know what it means to miss a night's sleep, some of you, it's like you just need to go home and go to bed, buddy. (laughs) And David says, well, our hearts ought to bleed. Do your hearts bleed like David's? I will refuse myself the most basic and necessary of human needs until God's house. And for us, this is his new covenant temple, the church, is provided for. I refuse myself the most essential of human needs until I can be assured that the provisions for God's house are made and that God is worshipped rightly and that his presence is extended from there. And it doesn't matter how many nights of sleep I have to miss. Friends, let me ask you in all of your doing and in all of your going and all of your busy, is this our heart's? Is this our souls? Is this this how our souls bleed? Paul would say himself that he had spent many sleepless nights in edifying and building up and caring for the church of God and the believers that comprise within it. In Deuteronomy 12, 5, The law says to seek the place where God would choose to make his name known and then worship him there. I want you to understand how this unfolds in the scriptures. 
Beginning with Moses, we see a tent that is constructed where Moses would meet with God. And then even beyond that, we see a place in a tent or a tabernacle throughout the wilderness and later in the promised land where God's people would meet with their God under very, very prescribed circumstances. Later, David would pitch a tent and that's where God's people would meet. Would meet. And then later, even beyond that, we see that Solomon would build a temple. And that temple would be destroyed by Babylon because of Israel's sins, which takes us to Ezra and Nehemiah, where the second temple would then again be established. And then we'll fast forward even from there. But for now, I want you to listen to Exodus 29, verse 43. God says there, I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. And the central covenant or promise throughout the Bible is laid out in Exodus 29, 45. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the entirety of Scripture unfolds the way that that promise would happen when sin would wreck everything all the time. So God was to be sought, to be worshipped, to be revealed in and through that place. Acts chapter 7, verses 44 through 50 It's laid out that after those wilderness wanderings of Moses, that David would then attempt to build this permanent dwelling place for God and for his presence. And then David would have a son even far beyond Solomon who would come, Jesus Christ. Psalm 110 says he would be enthroned in the heavens over all of earth. And Jesus Christ would be that temple. He would be the one who would house the very presence of God. He would be the one through whom and in whom God would be worshipped through his son, Jesus Christ. He would fulfill everything that that temple was intended to convey. And Jesus would say, this temple will be put asunder in three days. I will raise it back to life. And now we're not talking about bricks and mortar. We're talking about the life of Jesus Christ who would be raised from the dead. And the Bible says through the letters of the New Testament that then Jesus is building a new covenant temple that would house his presence as living temples and as one living temple called the church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised to build his church. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, strive to excel in building up the church. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says that this holy temple, the church, is built on the truth of the the apostles and the prophets. That is the foundation. Friends, we are that temple. And one day Jesus Christ will return. And there will be no brick and mortar. We will worship him and commune with him face to face. And he will own us and we will belong to him. And all the veils and symbols will be removed and we will taste the reality directly and immediately. I want you to look with me at number two. Having seen the promise to build this house and how God has fulfilled his promise to do so, and he will again, I want you to look with me, number two, at the resolve to revere God's presence. Look with me in Psalm 132, verse 6. 
Now we see believers are saying to each other and then to the Lord. The camera angle again shifts. He says, behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. And then he says to the Lord, arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark, which is the only direct reference to the ark of the covenant in the Psalms. The ark of your might. And then he shifts. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. And let your saints shout for joy. Be careful. We might be getting Pentecostal this morning. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. So the psalmist shifts from God to the people, and he's speaking for the congregation of the people of Israel, and they've heard a commission to come together, and they've heard it from two different places. Caleb's wife in the early chapters of the Bible is Ephrathah, and, and Ephrathah bore a son called in 1 Chronicles 4, the father of Bethlehem, and then bore another son called the father of kiriath Jerem. 1 Chronicles 2.50. This could be a reference coming out of Caleb Ephrathah, 1 Chronicles 2.24. This could be a call out of a particular distinct place that something huge is happened. We don't know for sure and exactly what location is in mind here. This could be the same Ephrathah that is associated with Bethlehem in Micah 5.2 from which Jesus Christ would be born. Maybe there's been some rumor, some word on the street about something happening there, about the Ark of the Covenant being there. Or it could be an altogether different location by the same name. But either way, it's associated with Kiriath Jerem. You say, why is that important? And I want to take you this morning on one of the most extravagant tours of the Old Testament to show you why. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. Rather, 1 Samuel chapter 4 will start. So they've heard something out of Ephrathah. Wherever that particular location is intended to be, there's a few different places scholars speculate. They've heard it out of Jaar, which is a wooded place. It literally refers to, to the woods. It's the singular form of the town of Kiriath Jerem. This is where the Ark of the Covenant rested for 20 years in the book of 1 Samuel. And if you want to take one of the most fascinating and important tours of the entire Old Testament, with some of the most powerful implications about the presence of God, I invite you to come with me beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 4 to understand what they're referring to about this call that they're hearing and about this desire that they have. In 1 Samuel 4, the Ark of the Covenant rested in Shiloh in a tabernacle. But the Philistines had defeated the people of God in battle. And when they defeated them, they mocked them and taunted them. And the spoils of their victory was the most sacred possession of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant. And so to gloat over them and demonstrate their bloodbath victory over the people of God, they get the Ark and they bring it into their camps in hopes that the strength of God would come with them and they would show that our God is greater than yours. 
You understand what this is like, men. From the very earliest ages of your life, you're on the playground and you're fighting with your buddies and you're telling them, my daddy can whip your daddy. (laughs) In a significantly more sovereign sense, the Philistines are saying, my God just whipped the snot out of your God. And we have the art to prove it. And so they bring that into their camp and they give a resounding shout uh, before them as they begin to gloat. And they, they defeated Israel. They captured this ark. It led to the deaths of Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas. And the glory departed from Israel. As a child, Eli's grandchild was named Ichabod, which means the glory has departed from Israel. It was a very, very dark day among the people of God when the tangible reminders of his blessing and favor and power were in the hands of the enemy. Friends, we live in a very dark day in our own day, though we're not in the same sense old covenant Israel, all of the tangible reminders of the goodness and sovereignty of God are being put asunder. It was a very dark time for Israel. You say, what was the ark? It was a sacred box about about four foot long and about two and a half foot wide and two and a half foot deep. It reached all the way back to the day of Moses at Sinai Sinai in Exodus 25 when Moses was given plans to build it out. Originally, it would house the original tablets of the Ten Commandments that God inscribed with his hands. It would house number 17.8, Aaron's staff that God used in a miraculous way. It would house the jar of manna that God used to provide for his people. And later it would be just the Ten Commandments, but it would guide God's people. It would protect them. It would move forward and show God's people where to go and how to live. And it would promise His blessing over their life. And and it would promise His might in their battle. It had to be handled in a very specific way. If you remember, Uzzah reached out to grab the ark as David was bringing it back. And God struck him dead because they didn't handle the holy things of God the way that God had purely prescribed. Well, I want you to look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 5 at what's happening to draw this climax in Psalm 132. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, you have one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and I know I say that all the time, don't I? The Philistines brought the ark into their pagan temple of Dagon, and twice they come back, they put the ark in front of their their own pagan god, and twice as they come back in the temple they see that their beloved God, Dagon, has fallen face down on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. So the second time this happens, they come in the temple, and the Ark is before their pagan God, their pagan God, signifying dominion over the Ark. And as they look at their pagan idol, and they look at the Ark, Dagon's head and his hands have been completely cut off. He's lying on the threshold, and the only thing left of this pagan idol is the trunk of his body. And he is bowing before the Ark of the Covenant. If you want to see the sovereignty of our God, even behind enemy lines where he is moving and stirring and showing his glory. God's hand was heavy against the Philistines. He terrified them. Tumors broke out on them. 
And then everywhere they took the ark, the same thing happened to the enemies of God. And so they begin to think what you and I would begin to think. We have to get rid of this thing because everywhere it goes, God's judgment comes from it on us. So the ark was in Philistine, uh, Philistine territory for seven months. They were plagued not only by tumors, but get this, mice. <laughs> if the tumors weren't bad enough, God plagued them with mice. So they sent the ark away with an offering. And they sent the ark away with a test to prove that this was God's judgment on his enemies, and it was. And the Levites received the ark, and many from Beth Shemesh peeked into the ark to look at it, to see what was in it. And God struck every single one of them dead for daring to think that they could handle such holy things so irreverently. So they sent the ark to a place named Kiriath Jerem, and it rested there and wouldn't be mentioned again until 1 Samuel 14 when Saul would retrieve it in the heat of battle in hopes of defeating the Philistines again. In 1 Chronicles 13, David calls on Israel with these repeated words, let us, calling on the people to gather brothers and sisters outside the land to gather the priests and the Levites and to bring that ark home where it belonged from Kiriath Jerem, where it had been neglected and where he had rested out of place for so long. So David orchestrates a parade. He celebrates. And this is when he goes to get it, and God strikes us a dead, and he realizes we better be very careful. And so he puts the Levites and the priests in place. And the people, as it comes home, and God's presence is honored, they begin to shout for joy. And David begins to dance in the streets. And his wife, Michael, says, how dare you as a king get so undignified? And David says, you haven't seen nothing yet. This is a day of great shouting and great joy because the presence of God has returned home, and he has judged his enemies. So the people are yearning for the presence of God during a very dark time when God's heavy hand has been pressed on, him, on them. And they're crying out to the Lord, and they're gathering one another again to worship, to honor God. And the bleeding desire of their heart to which they would rather refuse their eyes, sleep forever if it is what it took, is to get the house of God in order and to honor him the way that he deserves. Friends, is this not being replayed again in our own day? God, will you come? God, we want to see you honored in our land again. God, we want to see you enthroned first and foremost and for starters in our own church. God, restore the joy of your people after a heavy-handed season of discipline and judgment. God, we yearn for you. And we want the tangible reminders and elements of your presence to assure us that you're with us, that you have not forgotten us, that you are still dwelling among your people and your people are at favor with you and that you are strengthening us for the day of battle. Lord, don't leave us alone in our own strength because we will be destroyed every time and your glory will be made a mockery to be blasphemed among the nations. God, don't let it happen. 
God, return. God, restore. God, revive. God, make our hearts bleed for your honor and glory. And we want to see it extended among the nations. And so we want to start right here, right now. And God has given tangible new covenant elements for all of these things. Through the gathering of the local church around God's word, which is how he speaks to us. And through baptism and the Lord's Supper, the latter of which is how we commune with him and have tangible representations and reminders that he bled and died for us, that he rules over all things, and that he will take care of his people to the very end. And so we long for these tangible reminders because of, because of the realities that are behind them. Because of the communion that God uses them as a means to give to his people. So we see in Psalm 132, verses 6 through 7, that God's people have found it. Which seems to be quite possibly a reference to the ark. And we see that God's footstool is the ark. He refers to it as that upon which he puts his feet. Throughout the Bible, we see that the earth is God's footstool. We see that throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, that God will make his enemies his footstools. Think of the worst enemies on the planet. The ones that threaten to overcome the world and the people of God, they're nothing but a lousy pillow that God will use to relax and elevate his feet on a cool day. Which symbolizes the fact that they are going to be under his dominion and authority. All of the rulers of the earth, all of the mighty nations of the earth, and every man and woman, boy and girl, that set themselves against the throne of God and hold out in their submission to him. It's not a matter of if they will be put under his feet. It is only a matter of when they will be put under his feet. Psalm 99.5 says, Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. As important and as sacred as the ark is and was, to signify the presence of God, the ark and the entire temple would be nothing more than a footrest for the Lord. This call to the Lord arise, it's a battle cry. Numbers chapter 10 verse 35 echoes the same words. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said the same word, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord. To the ten thousand thousands of Israel, and God fought for them, and they went to war, and we know that there is a war on earth and in heaven, and Jesus says that he will crush his enemies. Look with me in verse 8, as in verses 1 through 5. Back to this address to the Lord as Yahweh, he calls on the Lord to arise, the invocation being found just as we read in Numbers 10. And then we see this call for God to make himself known again through his holy temple. In verse 9, we see this call to the priest to be clothed with righteousness, which means to be clothed with holiness. The priests were to be dressed with royal sacred garments and set apart. And the whole point is that they would reflect something of the holiness of God to be distinguished. Just as they were when David brought the ark back to Jerusalem 
in 1 Chronicles 15. The Bible says of us, in light of the new covenant, that we're priests. And we are to be clothed in righteousness. Romans 6.14 says, Do not use your members as instruments for unrighteousness, but use your body and everything within you for purposes of righteousness. And so the priests are clothed with righteousness And then they are offering sacrifices of praise. Look with me in your Bible. Now God's people, the saints, those who are set apart for God. In the New Testament, Paul calls the church saints. They are shouting for joy. They are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are happy in Him. Listen to Isaiah 61.10. The prophet says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as the bride adorns herself with jewels, We are putting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ and God is clothing us with him. So every day when you figure out what it is that you're going to wear, how you're going to clothe yourself and present yourself before the world, every day the first thought that we have, Lord, would you clothe me with the righteous garments of Jesus Christ? Lord, would you help me to suit up in the armor of God and put on the breastplate of righteousness? Would you help these things to be a reality in my life? Charles Spurgeon said this, Where righteousness is the clothing, joy may well be the occupation. We tend to divorce these ideas of holiness and happiness. As if if you're going to be holy, then you're definitely not going to be happy. And that's a reality, unfortunately, in many Christians' lives. Friends, I will tell you, as one in the Reformed community, sometimes Reformed believers can come across as if their pockets are filled with sour lemons that they continue to eat and they're just sucking on it all the time as if they're not happy uh, unless everyone around them is miserable. Friends, the holy people of God should be the happiest people on the planet. And if something happens in this church when we begin to get so-called holy to the point that we lose our joy, I am telling you, we are doing it all wrong. There is a soberness, there is a seriousness, and there is a sense of reverence. But there is a sense of joy when the heart is holy before the Lord. To the flip side, listen to me. You will not find happiness until you find holiness. C.S. Lewis famously said, that the story of human history is the long story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. And many of you are shaking your heads right now because you're like, yep, look for it in every single avenue. And it was a fleeting pleasure at best. And so they're clothed in righteousness and their lives are radiating joy. Friends, I really want my home to be in order. I want the roles in my home to be clearly established. I want authority exercise and flourishing to be enjoyed. I want our church to be in order. I want us to do the things that God says to do and to continue to grow in ordering ourselves that way. And if that is going to happen... It will be permeated with the aroma of Jesus Christ and it will smell like joy. 
not that cheap counterfeit that the world is knocking off, but the true and genuine stuff that the world can't give and not even death can take away. So look with me in closing at verse 10. The psalmist asked for the sake of David, God's servant, whom God would extend his throne and dominion. He says, please don't deny my request. Don't remove your promise and your blessing. And they pray that the reigning king of David's line would establish God's people with rule and order. And ultimately, Jesus Christ would come and he would set everything straight. The anointed one refers to, in translation, the Messiah. Anticipating Solomon and Solomon's son all the way to David's son, Luke 1.32 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house. Here it is again. The mighty one of Jacob, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So Jesus would be revealed as that king of kings, keeping his promises. I want you to turn with me to one final passage. Look with me in your Bibles at 1 Chronicles chapter 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 16. I know that you are probably very comfortable in the Gospels and the Epistles. I know that you can probably find Matthew a little easier and maybe even Philippians. But I've been on a crusade for the last couple of years, and what I want to do is give you the other two-thirds of your Bible back. And I want you to make your way through it and understand it and live in light of it and see how Christ fulfills it. This temple would be built, and Solomon would pray a prayer of dedication over that temple and over the ark that would reside within it. And he would pray the same words that we find here in Psalm 132. In 1 Chronicles 16.41, Solomon prays as we pray this morning. Arise, a battle cry, O Lord God, and go to your resting place. You and the ark of your might, let your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. And let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love. For David, your servant. And all of those things God has done and God is doing and God will do. And my exhortation to us this morning is now in Jesus Christ. Remember him. May we be clothed in his holy array. And may we rejoice as his new covenant priests. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you love him? Does does your heart yearn for him? Do you love the place of his dwelling, the local church? Have you or are you seeking to grow with other brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you desire your faith to be strengthened Do you want to proclaim his glory until he returns? Is Christ the desire of your hearts? Is he the strength of your life? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you've shown yourself time and time again, being gracious to your people, judging those who set themselves against you, and showing mercy even to those who blaspheme you. Lord, we thank you for saving us. And we pray that you would use us to save others who are dead in their sins, no less than we once were. Would you help us as we continue to wrestle and fight against our own sin? 
Lord, would you increase our desires for you? Would you make us strong for the week ahead? Father, we pray that you would bless this time of coming to your table. Father, as we come before your table, help us to reflect, to be quiet and still. And Lord, we pray that you would bring sin to our mind right now. Lord, would you be so kind to bring to mind the ways that we have offended you and offended others? And would you help us right now to repent, to turn from that? And Lord, would you help us not to keep ourselves estranged from you, but would you give assurance of grace to your people who really want to turn from that sin or that one or that one and really want to seek you, Lord? Would you help us? Would you forgive us? Lord, would you show a testimony of your grace and how you take care of your children? And how you rule over all things. Lord, would you bind us together as one body, one local church? If there are any grievances that we are nurturing against one another. And we've been trying to justify it and explain it and blame others for it. Lord, right now, would you forgive us and help us to turn from that? Would you make us one in Christ as a local church? Would you make us one with your universal body of all who love and treasure and trust in you? And Lord, would you help us to know you? Would you guard us? Would you guide us? Would you help us to be resolved to live for your glory and your strength? Father, we pray that you would bless this time of coming before you and coming to your table. Father, we know that your saints are weary from battle. Some are apathetic. Some don't realize the need that they have for you in this moment. Would you help us, Lord? Would you feed us and make us a holy and happy people? Not because of our own goodness, but because of your kindness. Lord, there will be some who will not be at your table. And we pray that you would convict them of sin, that you will draw them to yourself, and that you would do a wonderful work of grace in saving them and sustaining all of us together. Thank you that you are a great promise keeper, Lord, and that you always fulfill what you say you will do.